Welcome. My name is Robert Asensio, and I'm here today on this series, bringing to you the series of The Silent Struggle with my co-host, David Magnuson, chief, former retired chief, David Magnuson. I'm sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. I, I'm, I'm very proud to be retired. <laughs> Thank you very much, Robert. <laughs> and, and today we're going to speak with uh, also a retired um, member of the police, but he's from New York, Lieutenant Richard Mack. Richard Mack served with the NYPD for 26 years. And now he's dedicated himself to doing work across the country, pioneering work, not just police officers, first responders, but community stakeholders as well on our needs to stay strong and stay well mentally, physically. Well, how how do you deal with that? Let's bring Richard Mack on. Welcome. Thank you, Robert. All right. So so to frame it up, um, you came on. The NYPD in in uh, 1994, right? Uh, I came on in 1995, and I went to work in East New York, Brooklyn, which was a very, uh, I mean, you could call it a tough neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get there for a minute because I'm, I don't know if I ever shared this with you. I, I, I was born in uh, Kings County Hospital, Brooklyn, um, lived in the South, on South 2nd Street, down by Williamsburg. Uh, but but you can, meant- I, can, I, can I interrupt you? Yeah. I was born in Doctors Hospital, lived in Murray Hill, then we moved out to Left Rack City. So I think we all have a commonality oh, here. I think we're all good. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Doctors good. Hospital, I don't believe exists anymore. It does not. It does not. No. But yeah, it's all good. So now, now we feel a little bit more comfortable. Yeah, yeah. New Yorkers. Man, when we get when we get together, we have to have some of that pizza. There you go. So, really? so you know, you mentioned about. You graduated in the police academy with a small class. How large was that small class? My class was, uh, we graduated with 1,800 officers. That's larger than some police departments. 1,800, right? Now, that's not including the family, I'm guessing, too. <laughs> How big a crowd was that? Well, the uh, crowd, because it was Madison Square Garden, because that's the only place you could really fit that crowd. I think the crowd was somewhere in the realm of 10,000. Right, when you exit there, you try, good luck trying to find a place to eat. <laughs> They need anywhere near the guard during an event. That's <laughs> right, got you, got you. So, so you came on, and then you went. What, what was your first assignment? You mentioned you went over to work at Brooklyn, right? You were assigned yes, to Brooklyn. My first assignment was the seventy fifth precinct in East New York, Brooklyn. Uh, I got there in the aftermath of the uh, uh, incident involving a very corrupt uh, officer that made national news, called Michael Dowd, and I was in the seventy fifth precinct until. January of 02. And I got to see that documentary. You had suggested it uh, when we met in Miami uh, some uh, about a month ago, uh, the 75th. Yes. Uh, for anybody that hasn't seen it, I, I recommend it. Have you seen it yet? I believe I did, yes. Yeah, it's pretty it. mm -hmm. pretty intense. Yes. Uh, so when you, come on, when you came on, uh, I know that that precinct at one point was one of the most violent precincts in New York City. Probably in the country. It was one when of the you, most violent in the country, yes. What was the experience when you came on as a rookie officer, man? You must have gone right to the road and said, okay. what the hell's going on here? Well, in New York City, you don't go right to the road. You do a lot of foot posts for, for your first year. Um, I remember the first time I was third man in a car, they actually shot out a police uh, vehicle window. That was, and they had a, a car pursuit like the first day of my uh, third man in a car policing career to show us how things go operate in East New York, Brooklyn. So, were you in that stress, car? A lot of crime. What's that? Were you in that car when it was shot out? When the window was shot out? No, we actually were in a call. So, when we came outside, the car window was shot out. But uh, a lot of stress, a lot of high crime. And a lot of violence in East New York, Brooklyn, for the years I was there. And then you, I, I would imagine, got other assignments and then made it up through the ranks, right? You you ascended to the rank of lieutenant. Yes, I mean I've been to uh, several commands. I um, uh, during my time in the seventy fifth precinct, uh, I was there actually through uh, the nine eleven World Trade Center attacks, and I worked down at Ground Zero doing re a recovery, not really much rescue. And then uh, I got asked to do uh, peer support for members of the New York City Police Department with a group called PAPA. And I was doing that for most of the 9-11 time until I got promoted to sergeant. That's police organization providing peer assistance, correct? That is correct. Especially after 9-11, just how important that was. Uh and I saw I saw a bit of a video uh, and what took place during the course of that video that you were talking about, uh, where where 
people, officers were out at Staten Island sifting through, and I, I can't, I can't imagine. And I mean, if ever there was a need beyond once leaving the ground zero per se, going out to Staten Island and the task they had at hand, that to me was, uh, it's chilling. Uh, can you talk about that a bit? Sure. I mean, uh, to be honest, in some ways, the Staten Island landfill uh, was worse than ground zero. Mm -hmm. uh, it really seemed like almost like you were working on another planet. It was a newly closed landfill that they converted to take all uh, materials from ground zero to be sifted again. And the uh, commanding officer of the landfill would always tell us uh, we were there for one primary goal, and that was to find body parts to give families closure. And so what you do is you would have the landfill was, it, it had closed as a landfill in, in January, I think in March of that year. So this is now September. And the first thing they had to do was constantly hose the ground down because methane, it was all dirt with uh, obviously landfill material underneath. And the methane would bubble up through the dirt. So as you're walking or driving around, you would just see bubbles pop up during the day. And it smelled like a landfill. And you were out there all day. So originally they had mash type tents from a TV show. And then eventually they got these more uh, modern type of air negative type of uh, tents that would made it a little bit more bearable, especially during like a lunch break. You just wanted to eat or relax. Yeah, that odor must have been a killer, Lord. Not only the sights, the odor, and, and the task at hand. You know, you you pointed to something that I really hadn't thought about. And if you see my lapel pin, it's a 911 pin. It was it was given to, while I was to me while I was in the Florida House of Representatives. Some of the some of our brothers and sisters came to Tallahassee. Um, I don't remember the occasion, but they had a handful of pins, and I took off my state representative pin. And I put this on and I've never taken, this is the only pin I use because of what they said and what it says on my pin, never forget. We will always struggle to never forget. So thank you for that, my brother. You mentioned to me something that, again, I hadn't really thought about in that context, that the attack on the World Trade Center and the building's collapse, a catastrophic collapse, actually turned into something that was even greater, which is the rescue. It was the largest rescue of this, this country's ever seen. Can you talk about that? Sure. I always say 9-11 um, was the worst and greatest day in the history of America. Uh, it killed almost uh, 3,000 people, uh, like 2,700 in New York, and then the other 300 in Pennsylvania and Washington. And uh, the main thing I tell people is, that, listen, it was it was the one of the worst days, but one of the greatest days. It was one of the greatest rescues there was 25,000 people in the World Trade Center, and most of them got out. And that is something to be revered. And the other thing was the police officers coming from all around the country and firemen. And uh, I remember getting stopped by New Jersey State Troopers on the West Side Highway asking me for identification. And uh, to be honest, I loved it because it showed that we were all in it together. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, I, I grew up down in, in the village in, in uh, lower Manhattan, and my mother worked across the street originally from the World Trade Center. So I really grew up down there. And, um, you know, uh, I, I think I had mentioned to you also about the um, movie Boat Lift, which was a short 10 minute documentary. It's on YouTube. And it talks about how they evacuated, how many people were evacuated from lower Manhattan via boat because uh, all um, personnel, all transportation was shut down. So the only way people could get out of Manhattan was either by boat or walking across bridges back home. And that was a powerful documentary. Did you see I, that? I, you I, I, I did see I, I, You know, it's, it's also, it's almost synonymous about the leadership that Churchill, when he yeah. sent them over to Dunkirk and brought people back, that's the th thing I thought about, just the leadership that went on. And a lot of people just took that leadership onto themselves and said, I got a boat. I'm going to help. I'm going to take care of my fellow American, a fellow New Yorker, bring them back and take care of them. And, and you know, like you just mentioned, uh, LT, I mean, 
the worst of the times, but the best of the times in it, what humanity had to offer within New York and the surrounding areas, the entire country, to be honest with you. So it's an all hands on deck call for help, right? Where the spirit of the American um, nature just came out. We came on to address help. Um, sort of like we should be doing now with mental health, right? Um, 100%. You know, we don't talk about the officers who are injured. We don't talk about the people who are injured civilians because they just did not seek the help or did not know the help or maybe didn't have the, the courage or or the the support richard you were injured on the job and it caused your retirement can you talk a little bit about that because i'd like to get right into from there into your volunteer work which is part of this series that we're running now <clears throat> sure well i could say i've been injured more than once in the police department uh, i've had stitches uh, mm -hmm. broken hands. Uh, and then, uh, the final injury that I had within the police department, uh, during the George Floyd riots in, um, 2020, um, there was a, uh, a unity march that wanted to come from Manhattan to, sorry, from Brooklyn to Manhattan across the Brooklyn bridge. At the same time, there was kind of a new, type of uh, Occupy Wall Street type group that would had formed by City Hall. And they were actually trying to do Occupy City Hall. They were trying to take over City Hall. And for a couple of weeks, we had to be outside City Hall. Actually, we were inside City Hall to prevent these protesters from taking over City Hall. And the reason they wanted to take it over primarily was they wanted to, to uh, force the city to defund the police. And um, it was ironic because we were there to protect their right to protest as long as they didn't try to interfere with government or uh, hurt anyone. And uh, so while this unity march was taking place over the Broken Bridge, this group went and tried to do everything they could to disrupt it. And part of it was when uh, several officers were injured and while we were responding to the bridge to assist other officers. We saw a lieutenant sergeant that had been struck over the head by a metal pipe. And uh, as we attempted to intervene, myself and a couple of other officers got attacked. Um, I was, uh, one officer suffered a concussion. I myself had, and it was on the news, uh, had been attacked by a gentleman with uh, brass knuckle type jewelry. And um, I was, um, I received uh, injuries to both my eyes and um, was uh, jumped on and fell on the ground. And I had a fractured uh, eye. My eye was sinking into uh, my orbital bone. And then uh, I had to be removed from the walkway that broke a bridge. The only problem was you can't get a vehicle up there. So I had to actually be walked off the bridge, even though I couldn't see. And when I got to the bottom, there was uh, an ambulance along with the Occupy protesters who then proceeded to scream and yell at me and jump on the ambulance. And I kind of felt like I was a New York Ranger walking into the Nassau Coliseum, <laughs> but uh, based on the uh, noise from the crowd. And then uh, I had to uh, go to the emergency room, get stitched up, and the next day I had to get uh, surgery. Not a, not a robot, a human being. David, I mean, I think that points to a person that can speak to the hardships of the job. Well, without a doubt, you know, you, let's go back a couple of minutes. We talked about 9-11 before we transition here a second. And, and the word has, has been used in history before. Never forget. Keep in mind, there are some that have gone through so many things they cannot forget. It may sound synonymous, but mm -hmm. it's not. Um, and Is that the haunt that you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. There's just certain things that stick with you. And it can be vicarious, too especially in a position of, uh, of authority where, you know, if you're chief, lieutenant, sergeant for your men and women, something affects them. I mean, what, what, what affected uh, Lieutenant Mack? I mean, obviously other people saw it. They're affected by it as well. Uh, maybe not as much as, as, as the lieutenant was, and he, and he can speak to that. But, you know, there's these things that you just can't forget. And, and, there's, and this is where I want to hear now because I'm very much interested to hear what, what he has to say about how this, is, how this is working out and how we can get people to proactively get the assistance they need uh, or what we can look for if there's somebody else that's going through some, 
some uh, some incident or, or or trauma that we can help them as well. So yeah, that's a great point. Hey, Richard, can you help the audience walk through uh, seeking assistance for anybody that's out there struggling and, and draw some parallels to your current volunteer work, national work, uh, sure. and helping others? Sure. Well, first of all, let me just say, uh, you know, this the main issue with helping others is first they have to recognize they have a problem. And, and it also comes to the leaders of policing to recognize their officers not only may have a problem, but need to find a safe place to seek help without unnecessary retribution. So you have issues like suicide, which has dramatically risen nationally, mm -hmm. not just among uh, police, but nationally among the country and especially among uh, younger, uh, younger audiences, younger people. I mean, um, it's like uh, one of the leading causes of death, I think, uh, 18 to 24. And I'm sure the chief will attest that he has more than one officer under the age of 24 of the police department. And you also combine that with things such as complex PTSD, which is uh, just ongoing trauma or traumatic stress-related incidents. Depending on where you work, that could be very drastic. Uh, you also have the issue of depression. Something like 18% of the population will suffer some type of severe depression in their lifetime. And if they don't have a safe place to seek help, then that depression can compound and lead to other issues down the line. So back to why I'm in peer support is to give officers a place where they can get help confidentially and the goal is not to take them off patrol but to keep them in the fight keep them in top shape not physically but mentally and mental health definitely has a stigma that some officers look at it as a sign of weakness but the whole point of peer support is to give a positive light to seeking out mental health so they stay mentally healthy for themselves, for their families. And if an officer is mentally healthy, they can better um, uh, serve the community. So for anyone viewing this that is struggling and, need, and hasn't dealt with it or needs attention, there's a resource out there. Pick up the phone, call 988. That's one of the first stops. These people are there they're waiting for those that need help anonymously. They will talk to you, but don't suffer alone. You're not alone. I think that's appropriate, right? I, I do. You know, and going back to a, a conversation we had recently with a uh, Miami police chief, uh, Manny Morales, who as head of the department, he proactively goes and he said it publicly on, on, on a newscast. He proactively goes once a month uh, for just a checkup. Uh, he talked about it. That was leadership personified. Let it start from the top. And, and then the, the other issues. I mean, if, if you got 103 fever and you don't take care of yourself, you have the flu and you don't want to see a health professional, is that the wisest decision? Uh, if you tweak your back, you could barely move. Uh, not to see somebody, you know, to get that work done. Is that the best thing? Same thing. And more importantly, with, 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 the, men, with the mental issues in the sense that you get over the flu, you know, uh, six months from now, you go, yeah, I had the flu and not, I forget about it. You have issues now, you may get over for the, for the day or two or a month, but they haven't been dealt with with a professional. And so it's so important to deal with these issues proactively and, and as important, those close to people, just to keep an eye out in, in conversations, whether it's a, a colleague on the street, whether family, friends, you know, be there for them, be alert for it. You know, just like we said in the past, you know, if you see somebody uh, with runny nose, uh, sick, uh, barely can walk, you have a feel and you need to see a doctor. You know, you are right. You don't you don't look well. You can't tell basically with the mental issue component, so to speak. So it's really up to the individual person. I think the lieutenant sort of alluded to that. They have to take care of themselves as well and be proactive in that measure. And, uh, you know, the at least there's there's things in place to assist them right away, as you, you just said. But it's so important to get people to change that paradigm. It is not a weakness. Taking care of yourself physically or mentally is a Courageous. strength. It's a strength. Courageous. Correct. Because you're going to be better as a result of yeah. it.
So, Richard, I mean, I got to tell you, thank you, because you were part of the class that um, I just happened to go to the class in preparation for this this podcast. And and here I am meeting with some people with a lot of experience in law enforcement. And I wind up benefiting because you helped me walk through some of the issues that I was dealing with. And I didn't want to show it, share with anybody. Right. Some of my own internal anxiety. So I thank you, brother. Thank Your peer you. support work had, worked even though well even though that wasn't your mission there um what we have three minutes left two minutes what parting words can you give our audience as far as resources available to them um that they're not that they shouldn't struggle along well a couple of things first of all uh thank you guys for having me on uh, uh, i'm always willing to uh, share the word of the importance of peer support, whether it's policing or any other type of job. But there's a couple of things to remember. When you retire, the stress and trauma doesn't go away. I actually know more police officers who committed suicide after they retired than I do police officers who committed suicide when they were active. Um, so the stress doesn't go away. You have to seek help. There's no shame in reaching out for help. There's nothing wrong with getting help as you would treat any other issue you may be having. So you can do things like call uh, the Wounded Blue. Um, uh, 988, of course, is the suicide number. But you know what? Most people are not suicidal. But those who are stressful and suffering it uh, alone can lead to depression, which can lead to suicidal thoughts or tendencies down the line. You don't have to be suicidal to seek out for help. You don't have to wait until you're drowning to get help. You can get help today. You can, um, there's all kinds of apps out there that will connect you with a clinician. There's all kinds of departments that offer uh, mental health services confidentially. And if you are worried about confidentiality amongst your department, you can seek help through your local health insurance as well. The important thing is that you get help, do it today, and remember, you are not alone. Thank you. Any Thank last you thoughts, much. Chief? No, it's just fantastic information, and I hope it falls on very open ears uh, because it may sound simple. It's it's far from simple, and that's where you, you need that collaboration at, that he puts through with the peer group. You need mm -hmm. it with, with friends and family. Uh, with this sort of information to, to plug it in and use it because it, it can go a very long way. Like you said, silent struggle. Let's take the silence out of that and help. Yeah. So on that note, we're going to wrap up this particular show. Stay tuned as we have many more stakeholders, not just police officers, not just judges, but clinicians that will be coming on and joining us. We will have clinical workers from hospitals joining us as well. So please do not um, struggle alone. Drop us a line. Let us know if you need a resource from us. We're here to serve you. Richard, we look forward to you join us in this continued evolution of this series and our work in addressing um, this silent struggle that people should not be struggling alone with. To the Millers and Miami community, community News, to our producer, young producer, Alex Sukis. We thank you to you, the audience, the invaluable audience. We look forward to speaking with you in the near future.